we've got two hours. We've got a lot of, of uh, information to go through. What we traditionally like to do is we have the speakers talk. If you have questions, feel free to ask questions. But uh, today we're going to try and save the majority of questions for the end, if at all possible. Um, we do have more chairs coming. We did call in and ask for more chairs, so uh, we'll keep working on that and hopefully get enough for everybody. If you haven't gotten it, there's information on the SEPA program in the back. Please help yourself to it. There's also some swag in the back. And give us your contact information. Uh, we'll keep you up to date as to what SEPA is doing, new SEPA programs we've got going on, and, and get you involved. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, the SEPA program is an education platform from the American Sea Trade Association. We started off back in 2014. We started off with 11. Uh, 11 members at that point in time. Well, let me take a step back. We're an education platform from the American Seed Trade Association. Our intent is to help the industry understand the value of seed innovations. We also want to be a resource for those in the industry when you identify a new innovation, to identify it, protect it, maintain it, and enforce it. But also, we want the industry to understand, the industry to understand as a whole, the value of these innovations and the value of the intellectual property it's often associated with these innovations. In the end, we want to continue to innovate. We want to continue to be able to protect those innovations. We also want to reduce the number of compliance issues. We started off with 11 uh, members, and now we currently have 83. Um, our membership spans the seed industry. We have integrated seed companies, but we also have dealers. We have producers. We have grower associations. We have a large number of universities who have all come on board to help spread the word about uh, the value of seed innovations. And when I say seed innovation, I don't mean just germplasm and traits. Yes, that is a lot of what we do, but all innovations that bring value to the seed industry are a benefit and we want to promote, whether that's seed treatment technology, seed sorting technology, bagging technology. They all bring value, and they all need to be encouraged and continue to innovate and respected. We continuously are developing new resources and new values for our membership. Um, we're constantly updating our website to provide new um, information and educational materials on the website. Um, we have a wonderful checklist to, to help our members go through as they're identifying and, and developing their intellectual property strategies. But we also have checklists that are specific to your type of organization. Whether you're an integrated tea company or a dealer or a university, we have a checklist for you. We have our tip line, and tip line's been up and running since 2015, and every year our tip lines get increased more and more and more. We do get lots of tips these days, and I'm happy to say that the, the people who receive those tips are acting upon those tips. Um, we have a fact-finding program, which is basically a desktop investigation, um, and we offer that to our membership. Um, we have events like this that we constantly are continuously doing throughout the year. Uh, FAQs are constantly, somebody comes to me and says, hey, we're seeing this issue. We develop FAQs on that issue uh, quite often. Brochures, flyers, we talk about innovation or talk about intellectual property. Examples are in the back of the room. Um, and presentations. Um, we have PowerPoints that if you're going to be out there talking to the industry, talking to a group, and you want to have slides on, talk about, you want to point out intellectual property or licensing or what have you, we have PowerPoints that are available to our membership online. Um, data on infringement and compliance, as well as uh, logos and tip Um Education is the foundation of SEPA. We internally want to be a resource and provide information to our members, but we're also externally to the industry talking about the value of innovation, but also the different types of intellectual property that's out there. Promoting compliance. We always want are out there promoting compliance. We have a tip line, um, and like I said, it's being used uh, quite regularly. It's, uh, we are confidential reporting of suspected uh, intellectual property violations. It is confidential. Um, sorry, that needs to be up. Should have been updated. It's, we've gotten far more than 12. Um, and then we also have our fact-finding program. 
And then we're also developing additional services. Auditing and investigation programs are in the works um, and hopefully will be up and running in the, in the near future. So with that, that is an update on, on the SEPA program today. Um, our first speaker is, is Alice Martin from Partner at Barnes Thornburg LP here in Chicago. Uh, Alice is a patent attorney. She has a PhD in genetics and she has a specialty in, in agriculture. She's been doing uh, agricultural IP, agricultural patents um, for a number of years and she definitely has an expertise that is of value to this industry. Um, and so with that, I'll let Alice you know, take the reins. Good afternoon. afternoon. How many of you have actually written a freedom to operate opinion? How many of you had ordered a freedom to operate opinion? Okay, well, I think you'll all benefit from this. What I'm trying to do today is consider two, I can't talk about everything you put in a freedom to operate opinion. I think you all know that's a very complicated, expensive procedure. But what I am talking about today are two aspects to make sure you can consider that when you're either reviewing your freedom to operate opinion or you are preparing one. And the two aspects are evolving case law, and I'll discuss one case law that's going to be argued in the Supreme Court tomorrow in oral hearing, and also some consideration of what you should remember about marking and notice in terms of getting either damages for patent infringement, or if you're an infringer, to try to defend yourself. So freedom to operate opinions, I'm not going to go all through this, but basically the things to remember if you're going to order one is to make sure the person writing it has exact details of the product or process that you want to use. Because it doesn't do any good to do an opinion on a broad scope if your product is not related to any claims in any of the intellectual property. So make sure you have a good description. And convert that to keywords so that then searches can be done. <coughs> One of the problems we find in searching for things with plants is that there's so many places you can find this information and it's often not complete. Okay, so what you want to do, of course, is search all the databases for PVP, for plant utility, for uh, general information. Uh, but you also want to look on packages if you're buying seeds. There should be something indicating there whether there's any intellectual property protection. It's not always there. Websites now, since 2013, can be used. So if it's you giving notice to something on your patent, you can go to your website. You don't have to mark everything itself. You can go to your website, put up all the information, list all the protections, the details, and that's called virtual marking, and that will suffice. So if you're looking for freedom to operate, make sure you look at all the websites, the owner, hopefully, that you think owns the patents, possibly, the distributors, and any of the other possible people that are using it. And <clears throat> then match the elements of your product with that. And as you know, if there's a complete match anywhere, you have literal infringement, that's a big problem. But there's a lot of nuances, so if you don't have that, there's a lot of other things to consider. The considerations you have when you get your freedom to operate opinion are, well, what do I do now? There's, there's a problem. We either exactly match or it's pretty close. We could attack the validity of the patent. And some of the things I'll talk about today with marking, you can use to attack the validity of the patent. Is there some bar? That's the case I'll talk about today. Helson v. Teva. That's the one that will be decided tomorrow, or not decided, argued tomorrow. And level of damages. I mean, maybe you want to keep infringing. Maybe it's not a big deal, which you're going to have to pay some royalties or damages or look for actual or constructive notice that your product or your process really is covered by some intellectual property. Now, what if you get a really bad opinion? Oh, what do we do now? Well, you can license it from whoever owns it. You can uh, invalidate it. One of the big things that people are trying to do now, although I don't think it will be working for much longer, is eligibility of the patent. Is the product that's being protected really patent eligible. Did they get a patent some years ago? And now under 101 section, which says you cannot patent anything that's natural, there's a lot of argument on that. 
I won't go into great detail, but I'll be around later if you want to talk about 101. Right now, it seems that, at least in the U.S., the patent office is loosening up a little on anything that you try to patent that has some natural component to it. Could be a plant, a plant product. And before is where the patent office was knocking every patent application out immediately. Those are the ones you might want to look back at. Right now, things are loosening up. Or you could say, well, maybe I should invent around this. That's really the biggest reason you want to do a freedom to operate. Find out what exactly is covered. Remember, exactly in the claim, not just the whole patent application or the whole CDP certificate. See what really the claims are covering and see if you can work around that. <clears throat> if you can't and you can't modify it, you might want to abandon it rather than get involved with some damages. Or you can just wait and hope, and maybe nobody will threaten you. Now, what do you do for modification? Well, sometimes you do things like, well, we had a plant that's natural. We now put a genetic modification in it. This is modifying it, so maybe it's not being covered by the claims. And, of course, um, if you wait and see, maybe you can think, well, oh, it's much to do about nothing. Don't ever assume me. It's a little dangerous to think fast because, as I said here, we never should have waited this long now the weeds have completely taken over. If you wait too long to do something, then you may get sued and you may not have time to take remedial action. When you're doing a freedom to operate opinion, you have to, of course, figure out which type of protection might your product be in. And as many of you know, there's three ways to protect plants. They're all slightly different. You need to look at different things for them in order to invalidate or make sure that you are covered. <clears throat> the U.S. utility patent gives you the broadest coverage. Here you can cover plants, plant products, methods, uses, apparatus, whatever. Here you can have a plant that's either asexual or sexually reproduced. So it's the broadest coverage. And for literal infringement, you have to have exactly every element of the claim that you find in the U.S. utility patent. Now, if you're on the other side, you want to patent something, this is the broader coverage, and a lot of a lot of plants are being produced now are being covered by U.S. utility patents. The plant patent is also in the same statute as the U.S. utility, and that's important for when we talk about health food. They're both in the same statute. The difference is, for a U.S. utility, you generally are going to need a seed deposit if you're trying to cover your plant. The seed deposits are there not required by statute, but the examiners will often say you need it for enablement. You know, when you get a patent, you have to tell people how to make the invention. Well, if you say, I'm going to, I'm going to patent this stevia plant or this rice plant or whatever, and you just write that in, oh, I'm covering this rice plant, blah, blah, blah. The examiner is going to come back and say, well, how can anybody else know if they're infringing you? Because they can't figure out from just saying you cover this what, whether their plant infringes yours. So usually the examiner is going to make you do a seed deposit, and a lot of people don't like that. The plant patent is for currently for asexually reproducing plants. Uh, we've written a lot, I've written a lot of trees, you know, that are covered by plant patents. That's a big example. Now, there to infringe, it's a very narrow infringement. You get your plant, your tree, your asexually reproducing plant, and you get a plant patent. All you have to say is describe the plant, describe how you found it, show that you found it or discovered it or invented it, and that you asexually reproduced it, and it's read true. So, for example, some of the trees I've covered, you go down and look at the plantations, and you can look right down the road, and those trees, every branch goes the same way, you see trees down the road, everything's the same. The problem is, to infringe, somebody has, you have to show that somebody copied that plant that you covered. You can't get somebody for infringement if they say, I have the same kind of tree, has the same characteristics you talked about. If they say that and you can't prove they got it from you, they don't infringe. So it's a much narrower coverage. An advantage is you don't have to deposit. There's no deposit. <clears throat> PVP certificates, many of you are very familiar with. I know that's a different statute than the first two. A PVP certificate is for sexually reproducing plants. Uh, very popular in some types of the industry. Here to infringe, you have to propagate the protected variety. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But again, those certificates 
can be infringed by something that is not going to look exactly like the one you covered, but it will be similar enough that you will say it's the same coverage. Here you need, definitely need, seed deposits. So here the seed deposits are required. For utility, they're usually required by the examiner, and for plant patents, they are not required. So you need to know what you're looking for in a, a search report because your plant that you're worried about might be covered by two or three of these. They're not mutually exclusive. You can pretty much get coverage in all three. That means when you're searching, you have to search the USDA database for a plant variety protection certificate. You have to look for the PPA, the plant patent certificate. <clears throat> and the definition of variety is different in those two coverages. So that's important to keep in mind when you're reading the claim. And the utility patent, the U.S. utility patent, of course, you go to the U.S. database. And I'm speaking pretty much today only about U.S. cases. There's a lot of international nuances. And again, if you want to talk about those, I can see you later. The definition of variety varies. And I say, here we are with some fellows down at the ethanol plant don't like that variety of corn that they're using because they put it in the tanks and they get popcorn. So that's a very unusual type. You probably could patent that, but uh, <laughs> it's not anything that you want to do at the moment. It looks like some of my friends on farm did. <laughs> All right, all of the cases that kept coming down with an oral hearing tomorrow, and I uh, I did file an amicus brief in the Supreme Court for the bio industry who's very interested in this. Now, bio is very interested for our pharmaceutical and our genetic medicines and products cases and members. Here, we're interested in all of you who are not directly mentioned in health sense, but it will impact the things that you're interested in. But the case was over, it was started over in Europe. And basically the thing we're worried about is if you have a contract and you say you're going to sell something to a third party, but you don't tell the exact part of the invention that's going to later give you the patent, is that a bar? You may remember that if you offer for sale or sell something or publish more than a year before your patent, and here I'm excluding for the moment PVP, just for the other two pipettes. If you do more than a year before that, that is a bar to your patent. Well, here are these guys, Tivo, wanted to market the genetic version of Helsin's drug. And Helsin had contracted, no doubt about this, not a factual dispute, Helsin had contracted to a formulation uh, for, for a funder because they needed money. And a lot of you might have contracts ahead of time before your plants are out ready to go commercial. So they had a contract. The reason they had a contract, they needed money to develop the drug, the pharmaceutical drug, and they did this more than a year before the critical date. So Tiva, Tiva said, hey, wait a minute, you already advertised that to the public. There were news releases, there were things that were... And Helsin said, yeah, we had the agreement published, and it's public, but we did not tell the public nor give the public the use of the invention. Why? Because the critical part that allowed them to get a patent on this drug, they had some older patents, to get a patent on this drug was the formulation, the dose. So if you're dealing with contracts, particularly international ones, and remember now prior art, the things that the examiners bring against you, is global. It's no longer just things that happen in the United States or anything. So it's global. And the problem is if you are making agreements around the world and you somehow would disclose the whole invention, you probably would have a bar. But they did not. And so what people like the bio members are worried about, it takes a long time to get pharmaceuticals out, and it takes a long time for a lot of your crops to come out to be patentable. And in the meantime, you're signing contracts. We argued in our brief, if the invention is not enabled in what you disclose, that is not prior art. And we'll see there are a lot of contrary opinions. The district court said, not a bar, pre-AIA. How many know what the AIA is, the American Inventors Act 2013? Okay, well, if you don't, what it was is there was a big patent reform that, again, affects plant utility, I mean, plant patents and U.S. utility patents. And one of the changes they had there is that before that, your bar had to, your bar was not a bar if the patent disclosed and whatever you were putting out in the public was not ready to be patented. You know, to describe your invention, you put it out there, you said you have some contracts, but you couldn't 
really have a patent for what you disclose. Now, with the new AA, to confuse the issue and the big question tomorrow is what did the AIA mean by or otherwise available to the public? Did they mean is the invention available to the public or the disclosure of you know the agreement is available to the public? We took the position statutorily that it meant you had to disclose the invention to the public, not to say that you have an agreement. And the other side is saying anytime you have an agreement that talks about a sale or an offer to sale, you've got a possible bar. The Federal Circuit reversed it. They said, well, no, that's a commercial sale. It's a bar. And now it's going to the Supreme Court because the question is, if it goes through the way the Federal Circuit wanted it, that means you really have to be careful of any kind of contract that you say you have in the news, advertise to your investors, whatever. And it may be that any of those are going to cause a bar. Whereas we're arguing that you can't go for years while you're developing and not have contracts that may be advertised. You can't keep them all secret. And therefore, we, our position is you really have to describe the invention in order to be a bar. Now, if you're doing the freedom to operate opinion, of course, depending on which way this comes, you're going to look for the other side. If you're looking for the freedom to operate, you're the freedom to operate person, you're going to look to see if those guys that have patents had any bars there. If you're doing your own stuff and you're defending it, you might want to say, I didn't disclose the invention. So it kind of, like everything, goes both ways. So leaving that, that's, that's just one case. Okay, so the big point here is you really have to look at the local latest law that's out and see if it applies to your invention or the invention you're worried about infringing. The other thing to be noticed when you are doing the freedom to operate or doing your own work is marking and notice. Now, this statute is for the plant patent and the utility patent. And here, it says you may give notice to the public if it's patented. What you need to do is put either the words, the words here are important for notice. You either have to put patent or PAT or, again, the virtual notice. You can go to your website, put down, you know, the patents that are covering it and specifically what they're covering. That's since 2013. Patents before that did not have that opportunity. It's accessible to the public online. There's no charge for it. You also can put it on your package or your label. So if you're on the other side, as we'll see, and you are worried about a freedom to operate, you might be infringing, did they give notice? Did the people who own these give notice? And if they didn't, it's a big problem. So again, if it's your product, make sure you're giving notice. If you're looking at some freedom to operate with a patent out there, check to see if they've given notice because you may not be damaging, you may not be liable for damages even if you're infringing, at least until you really knew that there's a patent. So if you didn't see it on a package, you didn't see it anywhere you looked, and that's what you should be looking for in the freedom to operate, you should be looking for all that. If you can't find it and you get sued for infringement, the first you were notified is the notice for infringement. That's your actual notice. So the person cannot collect damages from before that actual notice. Although they might argue, as they do in some of the cases, you're all in the industry, you keep abreast of everything, even if we didn't mark it, you should have known that we had a patent. So that's the tricky part. So if you don't mark it, you don't get any damages until there's actual notice. And except if the infringer was notified and continued to infringe, the damages go for infringement after the notice. What does this mean when you're doing licensing of your product, where you're looking for other people's licensing? That means that as you're a licensor, and I know you probably all are on both sides of this, you want to make sure that in your license agreement, you put in a marking notice a phrase for your licensee. Make sure that they have a clause in there that they're giving constructive notice to infringers. Otherwise, when the infringement comes, if you're on the license floor side, you may not be able to collect damages until you actually sue them. It also is um, uh, discourages infringement. You know, if you've got everything marked, people have to sleep. I mean, at least I know my clients sleep a little bit. If we find something marked, they're going to think a lot seriously about whether to go ahead and infringe. It's harder also for your licensees to charge, charge validity, invalidity of your patent. So let's say that your licensee suddenly gets angry with you and they want to back out what their 
patent is that they're paying a license on. If you have those in and they mark things, it's a little harder for them to say, well, gee, we marked all this, you know, we, we are under the umbrella of the patent, and it's an invalid patent. It's a little harder for them to do that. If you're the licensee and you get this license that you're supposed to sign, you want to try to dilute what you have to do with the marking so that it may be that if somebody you sell to as a licensee infringes and you didn't mark, and the person you licensed it from marked but didn't tell you to mark it, you may get away free, and that person in prison may get away free, and the licensor might be out of luck. Or, at the very least, the infringer will be sued by the licensor, not the licensee. And make sure that it covers exactly not everything you have to mark, but only the things to mark that you're getting in the license. Okay, if you're not getting a method, then don't worry about the method. So, Licensing and licensee is very important to keep this in mind. From the freedom to operate, we find it's harder. Okay, if somebody's got licenses out there, it's really hard to find them. So that's something that you may just never figure out until you get sued. Now, how about the plant patent, which I, as you know, is a different statute. In the plant patent, you infringe by further propagating the variety, and you have to propagate that variety that's deposited under the PVP certificate. Also, if you export material or a variety that enables others in other countries to propagate the material, and you export to a country that does not have similar coverage and protection, there's a whole worldwide called UPOB all around the world. Each country has a slight different variation of it. If that country that you're going to doesn't have protection, you are going to have some problems, unless it's for food consumption. So if anybody's going to export material, you could be infringing under the PVP certificate. Now, what do you do in marking for the PVP? It's pretty much similar. The owners have to give notice. And here, in the PVP statute, it actually tells you how to do this. And basically, it says physically associating with or affixing to your containers of the seed, your seed packages, your bags. And a lot of the crops that have big bags of seeds have that on their label uh, or your containers, or again, you can have it uh, probably, it's not clear whether you can use virtual notice, but I would say that it probably would work. False marking is prohibited specifically, and the liability depends on what language you use. The language, and it's specified, is before, when you file for the PVC certificate, you should put on something like unauthorized propagation of prohibited or unauthorized seed multiplication prohibited. <laughs> If you see that on a package or in their website or anywhere else, that means they should have actually filed for a PVP certificate. There are penalties if you have false marking. If you put this on your packages and you didn't apply for a PVP certificate, you can have some problems with USDA. Now, after the certificate issued, you should put US protected variety or USDA protected variety. So that's what you're supposed to do for marking or anything covered by a PVP certificate. Now, if you're the other side, you're writing a freedom to operate opinion, you have to look at all these things, but if you don't find it, you haven't been given constructive notice. The reason it's important to look, you say, well, maybe I don't look, I don't want to know. Well, if you don't look and you get to a point where you're actually sued and you're in court or are being harassed, the problem is if you don't show good faith that you tried to make sure you're not infringing anything, you could still be covering good stuff with full damages. So it's really important to look and do it and document what you, how you look, how you had your freedom to operate. If you're on the other side, make sure you've got this covered. If you don't mark it, uh, the infringer then gets no damages back to the owner unless there's actual notice, and damage is only after notice. And again, even if they don't mark or you don't mark, if the court decides that, hey, you should have known this, you were sitting next to the guy in all these meetings. He told you about everything. So it doesn't have to be written down. So good faith means a, a way to get out of it. So make sure that you at least are covering all those bases, depending on which side you're on. Now, the liability of how about somebody that's not the real owner of the certificate, but is a dispenser or an intermediate party. There's some case law that says if you dispense the protected variety in a propagatable form, and there's no notice on what you're dispensing, but you received it with the notice on the container, 
then you may be able to pass it back to the owner. So you want to make sure that you give notice if you're a dispenser, and there's some case law on that. What about inducing somebody else to infringe? It's a little unclear, but there's at least one case of Delta Pine where the defendant was a D linter, a C linter, D lyncher, and the D linter was a transfer who the court decided knew or should have known that the seeds were covered by the PVPA, even they did not themselves have notice from the transfer. So the point you see is it's all very fact dependent. And in summary, here's my opinion, and you know, some people will disagree. I think FTOs are very necessary. A lot of clients don't want to do that because it's expensive. And if you do it, you should do it really full. So you say you did it in good faith. The complication is that the plants many of you have are covered so many different ways. And the really other point I want to make today, and we've talked about it with some of you, when you go to do a freedom to operate like this, as I do for the Lemmy clients, it's really hard to find what's going on in the plant. Plants, as you know, you have scientific names, you have a name during your development, you have regulatory names, you have commercial names. So the problem is somebody looking to see if what you have infringes has trouble figuring out <clears throat> whether your plant that you have is covered because all these names are so different. So you have to search for a lot of different names, and the best you can do is do that. So I ask all of you to try to get somehow consistency so that you have your scientific name and all these in somewhere, your website or whatever, so everybody knows that these are equivalent. That would be a big help. We talked about evolving case law. Keep up with it. It'll be interesting to see what happens tomorrow. And of course, you're going to have different perspectives if you're a researcher or a reader compared to you're the asset, you're the owner, or you're the distributor or the purchaser. It'll be a slight different approach in your FDA. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. That was fabulous. Um, just give me a second here while we switch out. Uh, I do want to say that I, I, uh, as an attorney working in this industry, uh, I have to completely agree with what Alex said and a point that Alex made in that when you do FTOs, I don't know how many of you in this room have experienced it, but trying to figure out the variety that is pat patented, uh, oftentimes you do have it as an experimental name or a research name, and it doesn't match up with the commercial name that's out there, trying to correlate what is patented with what's on the market can be very difficult. So as, a, as Alice said, I would definitely love to encourage people to try and try and to uh, make that easier for people. Okay, so our... So, Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Please, that point that you just made, is that a reason that infringement may not be granted? You mean if you really look and you couldn't find it and there's no notice then, is that, or you mean the infringement? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, if a patenter patents it under one name, and sells it commercially under another name. Is that the basis for an argument that you would not be liable for infringement if you were? The only way I think you'd escape infringement if is the patent claim, whatever it is, in any of these, does not cover what you actually have. And you could argue that you looked all over. For damages, you might get away with you know, not many damages, but at least damages from the time it's just, Getting away from infringement would mean that your your product and theirs may not be the same. You know, if they're if they're calling it one thing and you think it's another, you're, what I would look for is is your product really the same as it? It may not be, and that would be the way to do it. At least you'd make that argument. It certainly would affect notice. Absolutely. All right. Our our next speaker is going to be Debbie Hill, senior patent counsel at BASF. Uh, Debbie has over 18 years of intellectual property experience. She is a patent attorney, and uh, she works at, she is currently at BASF. Prior to the uh, changeover, she was at uh, Bearcroft Science. Prior to becoming a patent attorney, Debbie was a research scientist at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. So with that, I'd like to welcome Debbie, Debbie Hill. Thank you. Thank you.
everything. Thanks to Siva for having me here today. Um, really happy to see all of you. Um, getting out of the way from business, I have to say my disclaimer of everything I'm saying today is my own opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of the ASF. Um, but as being said, between uh, various jobs, uh, working as a scientist and becoming a patent attorney, I've worked at universities, I've worked at large companies, I've worked at startups, and I have many friends in the industry, the biotech industry or ag industry. So um, what I'm hoping to do today is to bring you some new ideas for um, capturing, for your system, for capturing innovations and how, whether it's establishing a new system or just improving whatever you already have. Um, I'll talk about this a little more later. I think our industry is a little unique and it, it brings with it some unique challenges and I'll talk about that. Um, I'm also talking from an in-house perspective, which any of you who work in-house know that that can be a little bit like herding cats, and so I'm going to give you some ideas for kind of managing the many personalities and many sort of conflicting goals that, you know, different departments within your organization might have. Um, so it's going to be a very simple talk. Um, I'm going to talk about how to create an IT strategy, implement it, and maintain I'm going to spend the most time on creating because I think creating the framework that makes the most sense for your organization and brings you the most value is where you want to spend a good deal of time. And once you implement that, it's much easier to have things sort of automatically um, move forward as you would hope they would. So what should be part of your IT strategy? Let me back up one second and say, one way, one place to start this is the SIPA IT checklist, <laughs> which is really an excellent checklist of everything you need to have in place if you're thinking of moving forward to enforce your intellectual property. Um, so if you haven't already done this, or even if you have, it's kind of a nice cross check. Um, so, but what you want to think about are what are the types of IT that would be useful to your um, to your organization. What territories throughout the world are important? You want to understand the cost. I can't emphasize this enough. You do not want misunderstanding between, you know, the patent department and your business about how much it's going to cost. Patents are not cheap. Most of you know that, I think. Um, understand what you want to do with your IT. You don't, like, don't be reactive. This would be a proactive um, exercise. You want to know how you want to use it. What do you want to do with it? If you don't really have plans to use it, it might not be worth the time and trouble, honestly. And that's hard for me to say as a patent attorney. <laughs> um, and finally, a very important part of this is determining who will manage your IT systems once you have things up and running. It might be the patent department, but it doesn't have to be. It could be, you know, business development. It could be its own, you know, little department. However, it would work best with, with your company or organization. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I think you are all familiar with this, and Alice covered a lot of this nicely for plants. So, um, but just, you know, you'll have to choose. And to James's point, we don't just do. Um, you know, plant patents and PVP, there are utility patents that can come out of processes and in processing plants, uh, the seed treatment, you know, there's a lot of other technology that we can tie in with the actual germplasm and traits. So um, back to the point about what should be part of your IT strategy. Um, territory can be kind of a tricky thing. The more territories you battle in, obviously, the more expensive it's going to be. Um, so think about what different countries, or, or two, two issues to think about. Um, first, different com countries offer different types of IT protection. So what do you need to protect and can you protect it in the areas that you're interested in? Um, like utility patents on plants are pretty much only available in the United States, so you'll have to move to PVP or plant breeders, right? Um, in other parts of the world, or find other ways to protect that. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that certain countries will be most important for your business. Um, you know, that's where will the majority of your sales occur? Um, what 
countries in what countries is there the highest likelihood of infringing activities? Those may or may not be the same places. Um, you may be worried about countries that may manufacture knockoffs of your invention to sell. So you know, it really pays to sit down and think that through. Back to the cost. <laughs> um, you can get a fairly good understanding of what the cost will be to protect your IP. Um, the type of technology you're talking about does make a difference. You can ask any patent attorney that you know. <laughs> um, biotech inventions tend to be expensive to, to protect as compared to like chemical or mechanical inventions. And the reason for that is they're more unpredictable and it's less clear when you find something, exactly what the end commercial product might look like. Because of that, you may have to file more patents along your development path. Um, the interactions with the patent offices can be more complex and take more time and that costs more money. So things like that. So um, when you work through all these questions, which I'll go through, but you, you want to keep that in mind as part of your looking at your budget. Um, other questions you can ask is, do you have in-house patent agents or patent attorneys? Um, if you do, will they do the actual filing, preparation of patents, prosecution with the government offices? Um, are you planning to send that work to outside counsel? Um, again, which countries, where do you want to file? Um, and what are the fees charged by the government IT offices? And I think my colleagues here can, can answer this, but I think if you can go to a law firm and, and give them an outline like this, they can give you a reasonable estimate of what it would cost to do what you're thinking of doing. Again, just so you can have conversations with the business and make sure everybody understands what you're talking about. Um, understanding what you plan to do with your IP. This is a kind of a hard topic to discuss with the business often. Um, sometimes they're not really sure. And part of it depends on the IP culture of your organization. And here's where I would ask all of you <laughs> to help us patent attorneys kind of build, educate and build support within organizations to help understand why do we protect inventions? What, where is the value in that? Um, and you know, how can we use that to our advantage? Um, I know, <laughs> I've heard a lot of examples of company cultures which do, they don't support filing IP. That leads to less cooperation from inventors. You, you may not even find out about all your inventions. When you do find out about them, the inventors feel like you're making them work a second job by helping get the patent application filed or whatever. Um, so really think through what's realistic for your organization. What do you plan to do with your IP? Um, these are just some random options that you could use, but you know that's totally up to your organization, and it will vary depending on what what you want to do. And finally, if you do this right, then you don't have to worry about any of the rest of it anymore. <laughs> Um, pick the right manager and everything will run smoothly. Um, but you do need to determine where this fits in your organization, what's the most natural fit, who, who is in a place to, to manage this effectively. And the reason I wrote this name for, which is kind of kind of speak, <laughs> but the reason I wrote it that way is in an ideal world, the person who's managing your IP systems and processes would have authority to get cooperation from everyone throughout the organization. In my experience, that doesn't always happen, and it's not authority. So it's more you need to facilitate this communication as much as you can, and otherwise you need to get people involved who are willing to go talk to other people. Patent attorneys may not always be your best option for that. We are known to be introverts and not all of us. <laughs> no, like a lot of us. So I, I mean to me, honestly, that's one reason, you know, maybe you have a business colleague working with your patent group to kind of smooth this out because 
I, I can't emphasize that. And if you don't remember anything else today, remember that you need to set up good communication and have people with the right personality who are willing to go out and talk to people in your organization, establish relationships, get feedback, find allies, you know, all of that stuff. Is, that is what you need for a really effective IT manager. Um, and that's what I would encourage you to keep in mind when you're thinking about how this would work in your organization. And then again, once you get the right person, they can take care of uh, running your system, basically. Um, so that's it for creation. So you got all that work done. Now you're in good shape. Now you need to implement your IT strategy. Um, for this slide, I would say the two most important parts would be educate and engage. Again, communication, right? <laughs> We're back to kind of the same thing. But you really need to establish some rapport with your technical personnel um, to get to, to facilitate these uh, more casual conversations and more informal interactions. Um, but some of the specific things you can do is, you know, set up a good invention disclosure form, train people how to use it, you know, have a fun lunch and learn, something like that. Um, and the other type of education that I would encourage is avoiding any premature disclosures that could bar a path. Um, so you could package that as IT confidentiality training throughout your organization. Um, just to avoid, you know, inadvertent disclosures of an invention by sort of uneducated people. Um, we're going to skip this one for now. Um, engaging your technical personnel, as I already mentioned, is also super important. And I encourage you, if, you're, if your organization is not already pro-IT, pro you, can, you can have an impact on that. You can change that. Um, Create incentive systems, you know, make it part of the performance review. Um, have awards for anyone who's an investor on a patent application every year, and who's an investor on an issued patent. Um, it doesn't always take a lot, but recognition that it's important to the company goes a long way um, to encouraging people to take part in this. <clears throat> the other thing I would really encourage you to do is include um, your technical personnel in invention disclosure decision making. So you've trained them to fill out the invention disclosure form um, and they've submitted it and now what do you do with it? And that's back up to this um, decision point. You need a process for deciding with individual invention disclosures what you're going to do with them. And a very good way to engage and <clears throat> educate your technical personnel is to engage them in that decision-making process. Um, it's, it's very effective because they can see it's not kind of a, it's a business decision. It's not personal. It's not, you know, um, you making a judgment on, oh, I don't like your invention or whatever. It is, you create a questionnaire, which may be on your so I don't know if you have that on your checklist. But kind of a, you know, would others in the industry value this technology? Is it easy, easy to reverse engineer? You know, have a panel of questions. Get your inventors engaged. Walk through, does it look like you should patent it? Does it look like it should be a trade secret? Do you need more data? And once you get them involved, they really start to understand, which makes this make more sense. Um, they become more excited about being part of the system. Um, again, it takes communication. <laughs> so it takes a lot of energy and outreach to really um, make this work, especially either in a big organization or, or an organization where it's kind of a new idea. Um, and finally, once you've done all that, you just need to maintain your IT strategy. Um, so these are pretty straightforward. I'm sure you could all would all know to do that. Um, but this last one, um, creating a way to adapt to changes. There are always changes in the law. There are new statutes that Alice was talking about. There are um, there's new case law. You may have to change the way that you're doing something. Most organizations, it's not that easy to be going this way and next week be going this way. It takes a lot of communication, talking, you know, discussion, figuring out 
what's more important, making a change, or is it too much trouble and you don't want to make a change, whatever. Um, so I decided to give you three examples, two of which um, other speakers are talking about today, just to give you an idea of like what kind of changes might you have to make. So um, a Defend Trade Secrets Act was passed in 2016, so new statute. Um, and it, it gives a federal cause of action for um, trade secret theft. So that's really great. It has a whistleblower provision, though, that requires notice to all employees as, we, as part of using the act. So if you're interested in using us, do you want to, or do you need to figure out a way to notify all of your um, employees about that whistleblower provision? So. It's just a business decision, you know, does it work for you or not? Um, the health and case that Alice just talked about, and she talked about this already, really, would this require any changes to how you're doing things, to your R&D processes, to your contracts, um, you know, with suppliers or with collaborators or whoever it might be? <clears throat> and finally, um, Lexmark, which... <laughs> Matt's talking about this one. This was a decision last year. Um, you know, this one re um, found that an authorized sale anywhere in the world exhausts your patent rights. Um, so does this, does this require any changes to your contract? Because the fear here was that um, for pharmaceutical companies that they might sell their drugs at a lower price somewhere else in the world at a, in a developing country or whatever. Someone could buy them, import them back to the into the U.S. and um, undersell the actual company selling here. And so you see, uh, you know, case law like that, we have to look at it and say, you know, do we need to change something? Does this cause a problem? So just examples of there's always things changing, and you just have to keep up and talk and communicate with your business. So how are we? Unique. I'm sure you guys could name a lot more things. This is five random things, in a particular order, um, that do have something, have some impact on IT. But um, things that I found to be very interesting in my work. First of all, breathing obviously usually occurs at remote locations, which is great. The problem is these are our artists and our scientists, and they're creating a lot of our our products that we'll be selling. But they're very far removed as far as training the program, I'm saying training how to fill out an invention disclosure, training about um, keeping things confidential, um, all that sort of thing. So it takes, you know, another step of communication and outreach to um, reach all of your technical people um, throughout the organization. And it's not just breeding, but it's the people at our processing plants, these processing plants, or seed treatment, or whoever could be located remotely. And we have to keep that in mind and, and not just focus on the folks in the lab that's next to our office. Or, um, the next thing, again, this is back to um, kind of the Lexmark case and having things sold you know, elsewhere in the world. This is a good point for our industry and in that um, our products are, are different from most and that they usually have a limited geographical use. You know, like soybeans with maturity groups work in certain environments and not so well in other environments. Um, so product sales abroad or import export may not be as big of a concern for us. There are also phytosanitary laws in different countries um, that affect how easy it is to import Plant, live plant material into a country. So we have a little bit of protection built in just by the nature of our product. Um, that's good. The next point, maybe not so good for us. Um, sea products, Bowman D, Monsanto, right, 2013. Sea products uh, may be self replicating, and if they're hybrids, you may be able to determine the genetic makeup of the parents. Either way, they're easy to steal. Um, you know, it's not like someone has to build a chemical manufacturing plant to manufacture the product. It's not like they have to build a manufacturing plant to manufacture a piece of equipment. Anybody, except me, don't tell anyone that I have a black home, but anybody can plant a seed and get it to grow. Um, so 
This is really important when you're creating your IP strategy. Keep in mind, it's easy to let your product slip away if you're talking about seeds, and you need to think about how you can protect yourself from that. Um, another thing that has come up, comes up and goes away every two years, is that the that biotech ag industry doesn't have any laws and it's similar to the hat. Hatch-Waxman Act in the U.S. Um, to guide generic industry. Um, Bio and ASA joined forces several years ago. We do have the Ag Accord in the U.S. Um, right now, things are quiet, but I just thought I would note that because the Hatch-Waxman Act is a huge lightning rod <laughs> for the pharmaceutical industry and for, for litigation. Um, and so far, things have been quiet for us. We'll see how that goes. And then maybe sort of the most interesting thing that keeps rising up to um, our awareness is um, access and benefit sharing of biological materials. Again, this can have an impact on your IT strategy. You know, the Voya Protocol, the International Plant Treaty, um, there's a lot to watch here. So um, if you're dealing with live biological materials, I would encourage you to keep an eye on that as you're um, forming your and maintaining your IT strategy. So just a few take home messages. Messages basically communicate with the other one. <laughs> you don't even have to read all of that. But um, you know, really try to educate and engage with other people in your organization and look for ways to add value. Everything is interrelated and you really need to look for how it all ties together and how you can get the most out of your limited resources of time and money and make the most of it for your organization. So, thank you. I just want to say thanks to Debbie for uh, that presentation. As a patent attorney, I've always worked as outside counsel for, for the seed industry. And in my perspective, intellectual property, patents, PVPs is everything should be like 95% of what you guys are concerned about. But the reality is, as I've worked in the, with the, uh, the SEPA program, I've realized the very small percentage of what you guys even think about. And it's nice to work with, with Debbie to kind of bring perspective as, as, um, as we're developing the SEPA program and, and help me realize where intellectual property really is weighted in the, it was a great presentation. You did a great job kind of explaining that. But I'd also like to point out, you mentioned the, the best practices checklist. Thank you, Debbie and Eli Corona and Susan Jane. Um, you guys are the ones who put that together and provided a perspective of what it's really like in the industry and what the really the needs are in the industry. As SEPA member, that is one of the best tools that we have. And I highly recommend you guys go check it out. Um, maybe you think you have a great, um, maybe you already have an IP strategy. Maybe you have a lot of systems in place, but the reality is uh, go in there, check out that checklist, implement it within your program. I guarantee you there's going to be things on that list you're not thinking about, or maybe you're not, you realize you have it quite enough. It is a really, really valuable tool. Okay. Okay. Our next speaker is JJ Saul. JJ is a partner at Figure of Daniels here in town. Um, he, he, Focuses on client brands and content from counterfeiting, piracy, and other trademark and copyright infringements around the globe. Uh, he executes cost-effective strategies for global trademark and copyright clearance, registration, monitoring, enforcement, uh, anti-counterfeiting, counterfeiting, anti-piracy, and transaction. Um, he also has a specialty in client-related trademarks, so he, he brings a, a, value, a value to this presentation it is hard to find in this industry and with trademark attorneys. Um, trademarks and plants are a very unique uh, area of the law. So with that, JJ, thank you for coming. Thanks, James. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Sipa. Thank you, Matt, for salvaging my presentation. Um, this is an exciting area uh, for trademark practitioners for reasons I'll go, to, go into on a few slides. Um, and to start, uh, and again, our talking about trademark pitfalls in the seed branding space. Um, to start, we're going to do a basic uh, refresher of what is a trademark. And a trademark can be any of a number of things. You see the long list 
at the start. Uh, primarily, we'll be talking about words today. Uh, but the key is that it serves for consumers to identify and distinguish goods and services. And I'm going to jump out of the plant and seed industry entirely uh, for an example here, one that resonates with me, perhaps it might resonate with you, and that's cheeseburgers. Um, <laughs> these companies all offer the same thing. They all offer cheeseburgers, it's the same product. But for me anyway, these trademarks indicate wholly different experiences and flavors and conveniences and so forth. You know, McDonald's and Burger King, they're almost ubiquitous. You're never too far away from one, but they have different flavors. Burger King has the flame broil thing going on. Uh, Wendy's, a little bit uh, juicier, plumper, heartier meal. Uh, talking about hearty, jump to Culver's in Wisconsin. It is a gut buster <coughs> burger. Absolutely delicious, but it's going to slow you down a little bit. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum, in and out on the West Coast. I'm not sure it's really healthier, but it tastes healthier, and it, it goes down quite easy. Um, so that's the point of a trademark. It's a word or symbol that really represents to you the, the experience of the product or service. Okay? You see these marks. You can think about flavors or conveniences or other aspects of the product. Um, and this is not only valuable for trademark owners. It's not only a proprietary right. Trademarks started out as a consumer protection mechanism. Okay, these are means for consumers to differentiate products of the same type in the marketplace. It's very valuable. It helps consumers find what they're looking for. It saves everybody time. Um, and that's a key part of what a trademark is all about. So you get these trademark rights. You have the ability to enforce those rights against competitors using similar names. Uh, you also have the opportunity to further exploit the brand through licensing. Um, so also with respect to basic background, I want to uh, situate trademarks in the context of intellectual property rights generally and, and specifically patents. Um, the seed industry uh, is developing new varieties all the time, they're coming fast and furious. And like other inventors or innovators, you're developing new products. And when you're developing new products, you think first and foremost about patents. You want that exclusive monopoly for your product. It's incredibly lucrative. But please, please, please don't forget about trademarks, not just to keep you busy. But uh, trademarks, the value of these can uh, really match and even exceed over time that of patents. Patents have a limited lifespan. You're talking about 20 years or so. And you can see, according to this chart, that the value of those patent rights really diminish toward the expiration date. And if you handle your branding properly, um, you can really have a very valuable trademark. If you think about the exclusivity period, you're the only product of that type out on the marketplace. That means you can be the only brand for that product out in the marketplace. You have the opportunity to build a, a very strong brand loyalty. And if you're anything like me, when a uh, patent rights uh, expire and a product is generic and there's suddenly different options, I have a certain loyalty to the original because I know what I'm getting. I have that experience. I don't want to mess around. I want, I want to keep things easy. So don't forget that during the exclusivity period of patent rights, you have this opportunity to build a strong brand that can carry the value of the product on for years to come. Um, today we're going to talk a lot about uh, an, ominous, an ominous word, and that's genericide. Um, each of these are uh, examples of products, uh, very valuable, uh, lucrative inventions, uh, aspirin, uh, cellophane, escalators, trampolines, uh, but they all handled their branding badly. Uh, they went to market with just one name. And when you develop a new product, uh, you need to have two names, one that everybody can use, the generic name, and then your trademark. And if you want to use only your trademark, well, that's going to be considered the generic name, okay? And uh, to have otherwise would ex essentially result in an extension of your patent rights. So cellophane, after the patent rights expired, what if DuPont said, well, now everybody else can sell this product, but they can't call it cellophane. Well, what do we call it? Oh, that's your problem, but you can't call it cellophane. You need some identifier that everybody can use to identify the product amongst the universe of all the different products out there. Um, so today we're going to tie this to the plant space and uh, the, uh, 
the UPOP Convention, uh, which was uh, acceded to by the United States in 1981, and there's been a, a revision or two, has some uh, key language. Uh, the variety shall be designated by a denomination, which shall be the generic designation. Okay, you must have that generic designation. Uh, and each contracting party shall ensure that no rights in the designation registered as the denomination of the variety shall hamper the free use of the den denomination in connection with the variety, even after the expiration of the breeder's right. Again, once that patent expires, it's got to be a name everybody can use. Uh, and that's why it's so important to have this generic designation or denomination. And the KRBC case really uh, provides a nice summary of this concept. Uh, the common sense notion is that when a new plant is created, it must be called something. And that when others begin to sell it after expiration of the breeder's protection period, they need to call it by the name that it's known, or otherwise consumers will not know what they are buying. Again, consumer protection, giving consumers uh, a term that they can all use, that they all know to identify a particular product. Um, now to explain uh, the results of this in the plant space, forgive me, I don't have a, a seed example, but there's a, a a lot of information about apple varieties out there, and I think this illustrates the point nicely. Uh, I have up on the screen the top 10, this is according to the U.S. Apple Association, the top 10 apple varieties in the United States. And if you look at these names, these are all very trademark worthy names. Uh, honey Crisp, for example. I love my apples crisp. Honey sounds delicious. I can't wait to eat it. Uh, a, a, potentially very valuable trademark name, but can folks in the audience guess how many of these names are actually uh, protected trademarks? Who's got a guess? How many of these 10? One. One? Very cynical, very correct, <laughs> except zero. Uh, none of these, none of these uh, companies, when they develop these new Apple varieties, took the proper steps to give the world a generic name. So their intended trademark ended up being the generic, okay? Imagine how valuable the Honeycrisp brand would be. That would be a, an incredibly valuable trademark. Instead, it's the generic name. Uh, and to dive a little deeper on this, oh, and I'm sorry, uh, you have to go to 13 on the list uh, to find somebody, a company who did it right. They developed the Cyfresh, and you see the generic name there. They gave their new variety a, a generic name, Cyfresh, that everyone can use. It's the Cyfresh apple variety, but branded Jazz. So it's the Jan, Jazz brand Cyfresh apple variety, okay? And, and to dig a little deeper on this, um, so the University, University of Minnesota came up with the, uh, the Honeycrisp uh, apple, and in, in March 1990, they filed a, a plant patent to protect this new uh, apple tree variety. The title of their invention, Apple Tree Honeycrisp. So, so don't do this. Please. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the, the presentation in a nutshell. Uh, don't call your invention uh, your trademark, okay? You're giving that word, that term, away to the public to use forever to identify your product. Um, and of course, when they filed their trademark application in 1991, that was denied because the USPTO saw the plant patent application of process identified honey crisps, so uh, no trademark rights were available. Uh, University of Minnesota did learn its lesson. In May uh, 2008, they filed a plant patent for a new variety, in this case, the Minietka variety, I may be mispronouncing that, um, which they separately trademarked Sweet Pango. So Minietka, the name of the variety that everyone could use, Sweet Pango was their particular brand of that variety. And they appear to learn their lesson well. They have all kinds of merchandise and are promoting the Sweet Tango brand. That's the way you want to do it, okay? Now, um, so uh, first things first, um, the critical period is when the product first hits the market. So you develop these new seed varieties. Um, this is frankly not an area where it can really fix what's broken. Um, as the USDA says through its Agricultural Marketing Service, the name first used when the seed is introduced into commerce will be the name of the variety, okay? You can't reverse course on that. As soon as that gets out, you're done. You lost your, you know, however much time you've 
you paid the, the marketing team to come up with a new brand or run trademark clearance, if you identify the variety using the trademark, uh, that will be the generic name. Um, and you see companies try to uh, resuscitate uh, their uh, reported trademarks that become their generic names, uh, but it really doesn't work out well. Uh, there's case law to this effect. So Blue Luster uh, was a varietal name for petunia <laughs> Um, as evidenced by the applicant's catalogs, okay? So if you start marketing uh, and you have get word out that the variety is called a certain name, the USPTO is going to find that, okay? So it's not something you can reverse course on. Cellophane is a great example. Um, they did uh, throw a lot of money at trying to get that name back and make it a trademark by trying to tell the world that the generic is actually transparent cellular sheets. Um, that didn't work out. Uh, they ended up uh, not only losing their trademark, but a lot, of, a lot of money in trying to resuscitate that brand. Um, so you want to have a, a naming system, and Alice talked about this a little bit in her presentation, that there are different names through the R&D process. Uh, you want to make sure you have a naming system and use it to identify uh, the variety, uh, the generic name of the variety. Uh, one that sometimes used the first three or four letters of the reader name and then put a number on it, uh, that can work. Uh, so here we're going to go through some examples of how to properly identify your variety. Uh, and the formula that you want to remember is trademark brand generic, okay? Use that term brand that helps you uh, keep the right order of things. And, and here we'll use the example of a variety XYZ123 and the trademark hot rod. So it's hot rod brand XYZ123 is the way you want to think about this. So let's test the group here. So we've got Heirloom University developed and released hot rod, a new variety of spicy tomato. Does that work? No guts, no glory. Does that work? No. Right on, because you're identifying the variety of spicy tomato as hot rod. Hot rod's your trademark. It's not the name of the variety. So that's not the way you want to do it. How about Heirloom University developed and released XYZ123, a new variety of spicy tomato to be marketed under the trademark hot rod. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> clearly identifies the variety as XYZ123, and the trademark is hot rod. You can't really do it any better than that. Uh, how about Hot Rod, trademark registration symbol, is a new spicy tomato variety that cranks up the heat while being resistant to early blight. How's that? Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yes? <clears throat> sorry, incorrect. Because just because you have the trademark registration symbol, you're still identifying the variety as Hot Rod. Um, so again, you're giving away those trademark rights. The variety is XYZ123, not Hot Rod. So that's not going to work. Um, finally, hot rod trademark registration symbol, tomatoes crank up the heat while being resistant to early blight. How's that? It's actually okay because you're talking about the kind. Tomatoes generally, you're not talking about the specific variety. So hot rod brand tomatoes crank up the heat while being resistant to early blight. That's okay. So that's the care you want to take when you're discussing uh, your variety and its associated trademark out there. Now, in developing your variety name, or selecting a variety name, there are rules uh, that you want to be cognizant of. Uh, a variety name should be unique to the kind of seed to which the variety belongs. So, for example, Prairie Road Wheat, um, assuming there are not other Prairie Road types of wheat, uh, wheat varieties out there. And the variety name should be different from other varieties of seed unless the kinds are not closely related. So you could have a prairie road wheat and a prairie road sorghum because sorghum are, uh, and wheat are, are different kinds, are, are distinguishable enough so that would not be a problem. Okay. Um, now, one thing uh, you want to be uh, careful about is your own company brand or other trademarks that your company holds dear. Uh, to the extent you include those in your variety names, you could have problems. And Delta Pine is a case, and it's different from Alice's Delta Pine. Um, but Delta Pine identified several cotton and soybean varieties as Delta Pine 20, Delta Pine 50, Delta Pine 102, Delta Pine 506. 
And lo and behold, when they went to register the Delta Pine trademark, that application was confused because they used it essentially generic, generically. Uh, the only uh, difference uh, in their variety names was the kind of model number at the end. So that didn't work. So be careful. Um, I mentioned a couple slides ago, you can sometimes use the first three or four letters of your uh, of your name and a number. If your brand, if your company name is only three or four letters uh, long, that could be problematic. So just be careful to protect uh, your company name along the way. Um, and a variety name should be different from existing trademarks. If you uh, have a variety name that happens to be identical to an existing trademark, you could face a trademark infringement action. Uh, and as you've seen, there are a lot of generic names that frankly should have been trademarks and are, are, are trademarkable type words. Um, so it's something to be uh, wary of as well. And you also want to search uh, the relevant resources, uh, for example, seed regulatory and pest division at the Agricultural Marketing, Marketing Service has lists of existing <coughs> agricultural seed varieties, vegetable seed varieties um, that you should reference to make sure your, uh, uh, your proposed generic name is available. Um, so, uh, and along those lines, clearance uh, it can be uh, very important. This is a fun area for me because there is this minefield out there of all these generic names that frankly should be trademarks, but they're generic names. So I've had the experience where a client has been uh, sent a cease and desist letter or received other enforcement action, and we ran a search on the opponent's uh, trademark. Turns out there's a generic variety name that's identical to that trademark. So we just canceled their trademark rights. And we looked great to the client. You know, they took this attack from another party and we just blew up their trademark rights. That kind of thing happens all the time in this space because there's this minefield out there of uh, terms or names that were intended to be trademarks but end up, end up being generics. And think back to the list of the top 10 apple varieties, all generic names. So you need to, uh, or you should, uh, run a search to find what's out there. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Spend a little bit of money on clearance to see the lay of the land to make sure you're not going to step on anything um, in terms of a generic name or other competitor's name. Um, and that's going to save you a lot of headache and a lot of expense and disputes or, or trying to resuscitate a, a mark that's close, too close to a generic or otherwise. Um, and also, don't think that the USPTO won't find generic names. Uh, this this uh, slide is kind of a headache, I'm sorry, but this is an example of the search uh, query that the USPTO runs when they're looking at your proposed uh, trademark. Uh, if there's a generic out there, they're going to find it. Um, so you, you do want to take this step ahead of time um, and see if you can find it yourself first and avoid um, avoid a refusal. Um, similarly, uh, international clearance can be a good idea. Um, and I'm going to put a, a few scenarios up on the screen. First of all, I've had the experience of the USPTO citing a foreign variety name in a refusal of my U.S. trademark application. Uh, because that prior search is so broad, they do collect, they do catch a lot of variety, variety names uh, outside the United States. Now, I was able to avoid that issue because the, the foreign variety name was not identical. It was, I was able to differentiate that foreign variety name from the trademark we were seeking protection for. Um, but even if we had to ha address that issue uh, straight on, I think there's an argument there that that, that variety name is a, a foreign country. It doesn't apply to the United States, and we could sidestep that. But it bleeds into the second scenario. So after establishing your, your U.S. trademark rights, what if a foreign variety with the same name entered the market? Um, now, it, in the first scenario, this, this could be even worse. Well, I, I, as mentioned a couple slides ago, uh, you would have the right as the U.S. trademark owner to take action against the incoming generic and try to prevent that um, as an infringement of your trademark rights. But what if, um, as we talked about under scenario one, uh, you had already received a refusal? that identified that foreign variety name? And what if your business commonly uh, uh, sold its products or otherwise did business in that foreign market? Those are facts that aren't very helpful to your case. Um, 
So again, it may be good to do some international clearance. You can do some high-level screening across a number of markets fairly cost-effectively, and in certain key markets abroad, it may make sense to do a deep dive. Um, and also, um, as Debbie was talking about, depending on your uh, your IP strategy, you may plan to go into foreign markets in a few years. And if that's within your five-year plan, it's a good idea to do that clearance up front. Make sure uh, the market uh, is available to you for use of that trademark and even get something on file to have that locked up. Um, so international clearance can be a good idea. Um, just want to uh, finish up with some key protection strategies and some licensing considerations. So when you're faced with these uh, competing marks or generic names that are problematic, you can always try to distinguish those based on appearance, sound, or meaning of those marks. Um, and that's bread and butter for trademark attorneys. You can also try to restrict your goods or services to avoid conflict. So if the conflict relates to, perhaps you file very broadly, which is a good idea because you want to maximize the breadth of your trademark rights. Um, if you have a conflict, you could perhaps cut that description in half and limit the scope of the application to avoid conflict. Um, or as I said a few slides back, you might be able to challenge the opponent's uh, trademark rights if you find a generic variety that has the same name or otherwise find that they haven't uh, complied with the same rules. So there's options available and highly recommend placing your marks. Uh, many brand owners think that once they get that trademark registration certificate, they're golden, they can just sit back and nothing bad is going to happen. The reality is uh, you really should set up a watch program to watch the relevant trademark registers to see what else is filed. You know, the USPTO does do a review of trademarks to make sure there's no likelihood of confusion. But the USPTO is really trying to help you get your trademarks registered when you file. And they're not always uh, providing as robust uh, a clearance and refusal process as they should. So you want to have those watches set up. And you might want to take a look at the internet or key resources, industry resources from time to time to see what other varieties are out there, what trademarks are being used for those varieties, um, to send uh, your cease and desist letters early. The earlier you catch that stuff, um, the less money the applicant or opponent will have invested in the brand and the easier it is for them to make a change and the less more cost effective it will be for you to make it go away. Yeah. Quick question for you. How do you set up a watch for common law use? Uh, there are uh, different types of common law watches you can set up. You can set up a general internet search or you can just set up uh, there's domain watches. Uh, there are more particular industry specific washes available as well, but there's we work with different categories and a number of trademark uh, search factors will also go search. Will they also look at state registrations if, if they're available? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I mean we typically uh, recommend doing a comprehensive search when we're doing clearance for a mark and that covers a whole host of resources, somewhat akin to the USPTO search query. It's a very broad search that will catch almost many um, so finally, some licensing considerations. And licensing is a huge opportunity um, for seed producers. Uh, this is an example, um, uh, jumping the plants, but SunMade um, is started out as a cooperative of raisin growers in California in the early 20th century. I don't know that they ever had patent rights on their raisin varieties. If they did, they expired 100 years ago. But they have steadily maintained and built their brand so that you find lots of food products out there, uh, for example, bagels, that don't just have raisins, they have sun-made raisins, okay? And that's that's a nice business relationship for them. This is sort of a ridiculous example that I found. I don't know why they would need a monopoly game, but it, it shows you the strength of that brand and the licensing opportunities that can be available. Uh, so it's a huge opportunity, but one that comes with huge risks. Um, trademarks indicate a certain level of quality. Okay, think back to all the hamburger joints. Um, when you go to McDonald's, you always have that same sort of experience. Yeah, you might have a little bit of variation, but you know the quality you're going to get when you go to a McDonald's and order a cheeseburger. That consistency is what a trademark is all about. You have to create a consistent experience for the consumer. 
And if you're not doing quality control with your licensees, making sure that they're producing the same level of quality each and every time, it can be uh, it can be what's called naked licensing, and you can essentially lose your trademark rights. Okay. And similarly, as we've been talking about today, you want to do naming control and make sure your licensees are identifying the product and its associated trademark correctly. Um, and here's a few examples from a, a rose breeder client uh, that we represent. And they identify very clearly, they have their variety trademark, uh, their collection trademark, and then finally, their varietal name, the generic name, identifying that particular variety. Um, and they also, in the, the same naming guidelines, they, put, they have the logos and a specific color uh, that those logos are supposed to appear in. They might have other marketing materials like hang tags or what have you, and provide detailed specifications so you keep the naming consistent uh, for the products throughout the licensing uh, process. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be happy to entertain questions after the presentation. Thanks, JJ. I'll say I, I particularly like the slide that uh, JJ had on here that talked about um, the front end, the value of patents and PVPs, and the trademark going and the crossing over time. Um, we, it, it's, it's in this industry, we we do a, we focus on patents and PVPs so much. But that that slide was great because trademarks do uh, the, the goodwill of a trademark is the value, and that goodwill increases over time to the point where they cross over in value, and the trademark can keep increasing like that sun, um, and Trademarks are invaluable in this industry, um, but un unfortunately, they're often forgotten about. Um, but um, with that, we have our last speaker of the day. So our last speaker today is Matt Grant. Uh, Matt Grant is a partner at Bush Blackwell in St. Louis. Um, Matt has extensive experience in a variety of legal issues such as crop, uh, crop seed bag labeling, patents, trademarks, and variety protection, uh, as well as legal issues involving crop ranging, cross ranging from corn, soybeans, cotton, alfalfa, canola, myo, milo, and kidney bean. Um, Matt has participated in pre-litigation claims, jury, and bench trials uh, related to private seed company and public universities' uh, assertion of utility, uh, plant patents, and PVPs. Matt has done some of the preeminent cases, uh, litigation cases in our industry, uh, including uh, Monsanto v. Scrubs, which has established some great case law that we all benefit from uh, as an industry. So with that, I'd like to welcome Matt Grant. having me once again. Um, before I get started, let me uh, take a survey of the room by hand. Who was here last year for this uh, the SEPA presentation? All right, so only a few of you are going to be disappointed. So bad news first. We're going to cover, we're going to plow a little bit of the same ground because we're going to talk about Lexmark for our new, for our, the new faces uh, in the room and on the phone. But in order to talk about how Lexmark has evolved and have been interpreted, we unfortunately have to talk a little bit about what the case was was indeed about. So let's get started. So Lexmark was a patent exhaustion case. It was a seminal case out of the United States Supreme Court. Now, what did the case uh, deal with? So Lexmark sells printer cartridges. At your home, you probably have a printer, but then you run out of ink, you pull the little cartridge out, and you go to Walmart or wherever, and you buy a new one to stick it back in. Well, what Lexmark had gotten away with for years, which was they had prohibited their customers from taking that cartridge and reselling it to, to another company that would fill it up with ink and then sell it at 10 cents on the dollar. It destroyed their market share. So they did everything they could to try to stop that. And what they had developed is a two-phase sales uh, system where you can pay a higher price and you can do whatever you want with your cartridge when you're done, or you pay the lower price, but then you have to return it. And the, the, the way they got away with this is that that cartridge was patented and that all made total sense um, because under the Federal Circuit uh, precedent, going back to 1992, it's totally allowed. 
So there was a rule. Basically, any reasonable um, license restriction that accompanied a sale was enforceable. Um, and we'll talk about how that applies to the seed industry. So, which is, if I sold you something, as long as I you didn't try to violate um, some sort of antitrust uh, or somehow anti-competitive, as long as there was a reasonable restriction, I could sell you a printer cartridge and, as well, and tell you, hey, you have to mail it back to me. Don't sell it to that company on the internet because they're just going to resell it and they're going to kill my margin and my market share. Um, so the Federal Circuit got the case and they said, wait a minute, this is easy. We ruled on this back in 1992. We've been doing this for 25 years. That sale to the reseller, and I guess I should have pointed out, so that's who they sued. They didn't sue the, the individual customers. We'll talk about why that makes no sense. Uh, what they did is that the, the resale market, the, the internet company, if we'll call them, uh, actually, uh, Imagination is, this was their name, but so what they did is they went against uh, the, the big fish who was creating the resale, so in their mind, the black market. So they sued them and they won, went up to the federal circuit and they won again and said, you can't do that. You know you weren't supposed to buy that from all these customers. That's patented. You knew there was a contractual restriction that those people couldn't sell it to you. You can't refill it and you can't resell it. This is easy. Well, it went up to the Supreme Court. They said, you know what, Federal Circuit? So just quickly, the Supreme Court obviously is the top. And the patent law of Federal Circuit is, is the appellate court uh, level. The, federal, uh, the Supreme Court said, you know what, Federal Circuit? For 25 years, you've been getting this wrong. And they said, you're totally wrong. If you actually make a sale of a patented item, that's it. You can't. You can put all kinds of contractual restrictions on it, but you lose your patent rights. And we'll talk about why that's important. So what they said is, a patentee, you can impose restrictions on licensees. So if, you, if I license someone to make printer cartridges, I have a lot more control. But if I just sell printer cartridges, I'm, I'm actually, it's a, it's a restraint on the alienation as a sale, because I'm exchanging, um, there, here's the difference, we'll talk about this later, it's whether I'm exchanging rights or goods. So the Supreme Court reversed. And, um, and that's uh, a rather important decision for a lot of industries, particularly uh, the seed industry. So the one thing that the, the Supreme Court did go on to say is, we, again, there's a difference between a sale and a license. So if you make a sale, you're done. Your patent rights are gone. Uh, it, uh, but if, if you pursue a license, you have a lot more control. So the, at the end of the day, where do we end up last year? So that decision came down in 2017. And the only the fair reading of that opinion is, uh, is it a sale or a license? That is the bright line rule and invokes decide we're at a fork in the road. Um, so basically, if I engage in a sale, um, my, my contractually agreed upon uh, uh, language with my customer is still enforceable. So let's see, I can still sue. So Lexmark could still go sue all those customers because they still violated the contract, right? So, but they couldn't sue the, the, the internet company, because they have no contract with the internet company and their patent rights died. So that doesn't really work for Lexmark, <laughs> because they say, okay, we sell millions of these through Walmart, what am I going to do? Go sue by, via contract all these people that pay $7.99 for a printer cartridge. So that does not, that does not, oh, I did it again. That did not work for them. So then I've been kind of monitoring this to see what they're going to do. And we'll talk about this later. So the obvious circumvention of that decision is, let's not do sales. Let's do licenses. Well, Lexmark actually didn't do that. It's interesting to see what they did. I just went on their website um, a couple of days ago. So what they've done now is launched an environmentally friendly campaign. So what they say is, I'm selling you this cartridge. You can do anything you want with it. But if you're environmentally friendly, you will send it back to me, and I will properly dispose of it. And we will all protect the environment together. Now, does anyone believe that the environment <laughs> plays any role in that? I would say, well, I'll keep my opinion to myself, but I think it's pretty obvious. So, <laughs> so Lexmark, again, well, let's bring it home. Why do we care in the seed industry? Um, so seed companies often sell their seed to growers. Historically, patented seed associated with a limited use license. And what does that license restrict? Well, you can't save seed, can't resell seed, and you can't resell to your neighbors. Like so much of the, many of the corn licenses I've seen said, if you plant it or you return it, what you can't do is sell it to your neighbor. What about geographic pricing? That's the other thing where this kit potentially kicks in. Well, you not only can you not sell it to your neighbor, you can't buy, you know, corn with 10 stack traits 
in northern Arkansas and sell it to your buddy in Springfield, Illinois. That, that doesn't, you know, that, that's typically been prohibited. It destroys the whole geographic pricing strategy. And then finally, we'll talk about this, what I think is um, important is how does it impact a seed company's rights in a foreclosure and bankruptcy? Because again, this is the key. Once you sell that seed, and, and we'll talk about this, to your seed dealer, which is nine, nine times out of 10 what I've seen is how, how you go to market strategy. Once you've made that sale, even on credit, you lose your patent rights. And we'll talk about the implications of that. So talk about, the, we talked the first thing, <clears throat> grower save seed and, and uh, saving their own seed or reselling their harvested seed. So does, did Lexmark, Lexmark impact that? And as we talked about last year, our prediction was that Bowman clearly still holds and is clearly reconcilable with Lexmark because Lexmark deals with the bag of seed I sold you, not the harvest that you created with that bag of seed. So we, we predicted that they can easily coexist. Well, this last year, we actually found a case, only case that I'm aware of, reported decision, just came down recently, out of the Eastern District of Michigan Federal Court, that actually, the only, it, it wasn't an agricultural case, interestingly enough, but it went through a lengthy discussion of Lexmark and how it changed the landscape and changed the rules, but then in the very next paragraph, the next sentence, it cited to the Bowman case and said, well, but then again, there's a, we're still talking about the item I sold you. It does have nothing to do with additional items. So that's, it. that's important um, and something, a case that you'll want to cite um, if, unfortunately, your company finds yourself in litigation and that issue arises. Um, what about the, as I talked about before, the, the closed distribution network and geographic pricing? So uh, Lexmark, unfortunately, may have essentially eviscerated your ability to have a closed distribution network. Once you sell to your dealer, your dealer resells to someone you don't want them to do business with, that you don't want to have anything to do with, or someone that lives in a different state, you have no recourse against that, the, the, the second party in the chain of, chain of, uh, of distribution. Now, you, it doesn't mean you're out of luck completely, so you can go sue your dealer, right? Sue, uh, file a breach of contract, cause of action. Well, that's not very attractive because you really want to nip in the bud. Well, you probably want to uh, address the dealer, but you really want to address potentially the, the grower that maybe you parted ways with that grower in a previous season. They didn't pay their bill or otherwise you just didn't want to do business with them. Well, now, if they go to an authorized outlet, there's really nothing you can do to them. You have to track it back to the dealer. And that's the other rub. So I've done this uh, over the years is how do you figure out who the dealer was? You know, who's their source? So you get a phone call, say there's a truckload of, of corn hybrids that have 10 stacks um, uh, on a farm in, in, in Arkansas, I'm sorry, in Illinois, and it came on a truck with plates from Arkansas. Well, what are you going to do there? You can't, can you sue that individual? No, they, they, have, they have no reason to believe they did anything wrong. Well, okay, I'll, let's go sue my, let's go find the, the dealer. He's a, he or she is a problem. Let's go have a talk. Well, how are you going to do that? So I, I've been in situations where we've even tracked down lot numbers. We were able to find that th those bags on a public right of way, get images of the, of the actual lot numbers. But even then, I, I can tell you it's very difficult with even a lot number to narrow it down to a particular dealer. So again, so you, so you can go sue your dealer. That's, that's not really any fun. And you're not going to get much money. So you're going to sue on breach of contract damages. Those are very hard to prove. That's actual damages. So you have to show I'm out this much, these many dollars because of what you did. I, you know, the more attractive thing that we have used to do, <laughs> which was sue the end user, the grower that had the seed that didn't, wasn't licensed, wasn't supposed to have it, you could sue that individual under the patent statute. And then you could argue a reasonable royalty, which we won't get into that too much. But basically, how much would you, I have made you pay me to force me to allow you to have the seed I don't want you to have. And that number can climb pretty quickly. Um, so here, this is another, and this is really where I think it kicks in uh, additionally, is what if your dealer files bankruptcy or his or her property is foreclosed upon? In the past, pre-lex marks, could you go in there as a seed company and say, wait a minute, he or she has a warehouse full of thousands of my corn hybrid that has 10 patented traits in it. You can, you can't take that, even though you have a first lien on all collateral, including inventory. I have patent rights. 
I, I, I win. I've actually argued that in, in federal court in Illinois. It actually worked. The judge had never heard it before, but because um, bankruptcy judges are used to let's auction everything off at the highest bidder. That's just what they do. That's what they, you know, it, it makes sense. Let's get a squeeze blood out of this turnip and, and spread it around. But post let mark, Lex mark, what can you do? Again, if, if once it's a sale and it's out of your hands, you no longer have patent rights. So what, what's your what's your hammer? What are you going to the court with when they say we're going to put all this corn seed on eBay? And I've seen that done in bankruptcy cases, not necessarily with corn, but we're going to we're going to auction off all of your patented uh, seed to the highest bidder anywhere in the country. As long as they pay shipping, we're going to we're not even going to tell you necessarily where it went. But don't worry, you're going to get your 10 cents on the dollar like every other unsecured creditor. So that's a tough spot to be in. Now, some companies don't really care. Um, like I said, I've, I've represented startups, public universities, one, uh, one of the largest seed companies in the world. Um, Along that spectrum, there's very, very, uh, a very, a various variability in interest as to where that seed goes. Some companies really care; they want to track it to the farm. Um, some companies say they don't care. I want to get paid. That's that's what I care about. So, what, what's the potential solution? So again, it all comes down to a sale. So, how can we fix this? So, we could switch to a bailment arrangement. So, a bailment um, is essentially and you've seen it in the industry, they don't call it this, but you're, you're, a, you're a, a, a seedsman, you're an agent. So I'm gonna put my seed, you're gonna use my forms, my invoices, the seed's gonna sit on your property and you're gonna sell it, but you're selling it on my behalf. I never sold it to you. I might give you a, you know, a commission on the back end, but so the title never changes hands. So in that scenario, my, my personal opinion, you have a pretty strong argument. Um, so what, what's a, the more extreme change? So again, we talked about before is a sale versus a license. Well, why don't we just stop selling seeds? We can just license seed. We can license our dealers, and our dealers could license our growers. Um, you know, is that a viable concept? I actually thought that's what Lexmark, Lexmark was going to do, was license uh, consumers to use their cartridges and then return them, but they haven't done that. So, so I guess you, so you have two layers. So can we make dealers license seeds? Or can we make growers uh, two layers down licensees? At the end of the day, this is the most interesting thing. Will a court believe it? Can you license someone to use a seed that they never return? We're not talking about a lease per se, like a vehicle. But can I license you to use something that necessarily evolves into a plant? So I think I think you can. Um, no one's done it yet. So it comes back to sale of goods versus license of rights. So again, where do trait and genetic licenses fit in this whole scenario? So think about the hypothetical I just gave you. So when you license your seed to your seed, your seed companies below you or your, your genetics or your traits, we go back to that other slide. It was, do, are you licensing an idea or are you selling a good? So you're going to think your gut reaction is, no, I'm licensing my patent rights, my idea. I would argue, no, that's not right. How do you get your genetics or your traits to your licensee? You ship them a bag of parent seed. You ship them inbred corn, right? Is that a sale or is that a license? So it's a shipment of goods. So anyway, it would be very interesting to see what, if and when that issue arises, how the courts deal with it. So moving to some of the cases that have interpreted Lexmark this year and, and late last year, we've got a couple here that lay out the, lay, uh, the, lay out the imp imp impact of the decision. So in the first one in Delaware, someone wrote a very extensive license agreement, but it had very few restrictions. So all focused on royalties. That's what everybody thinks about. I got to get my royalties, but it had very other, very few other restrictions. So when their licensee sold LCD parts to their competitor to make TVs, they complained. Well, they went to the court and they said, well, "Wait a minute, you didn't restrict that. So that your patent rights are exhausted, um, and your licensee did everything right." Then on the flip side, you've got the Crimar case, um, which they took the, the opposite approach. They had a very comprehensive license agreement, had a lot of restrictions, and told you basically a roadmap. This is, only, this is what you can do, and only what you can do. And so the court found that because the licensee went beyond that, that, they could, that the patent owner could go after the third party because the sales that the licensee made were not authorized. So it all comes down to not only a sale, but it has to be an authorized sale. 
And whether or not that sale is authorized is governed by the four corners of that license agreement. So that's the lesson, is include as many comprehensive restrictions on your trait and germ, germplasm licenses that you can. Um, so uh, if not, you'll certainly be found to have exhausted um, uh, your patent rights. So what else did we learn this year? So, so somebody else came back, so talking about royalty, and actually this case, um, I think Alice mentioned it, uh, this case involves the lack of payment of royalties and the lack of, of patent marking. And so the licensee would quit paying their bills, didn't put the patent numbers on there, was still selling all this product out the door. So this company, uh, Canel Manufacturing, sued one of the, the buyers and said, wait a minute, that's not an authorized sale. I'm going to assert my patent rights. So the Northern District of Illinois just came up with the who, what, when, and where. So it doesn't matter if I, if I, did, if I violated the license term, and well, then I have to pay you a royalty. Um, and it doesn't matter that I didn't put your patent number on the product as I told you I would. It just matters that I sold to the right person, I sold the right thing at the right time at the right place. Um, and then finally, I told you I'd move talk fast. Um, we've got the audio MPEG decision. Very interesting. I think James mentioned it. it. Has nothing to do with agriculture, but it talks about Lexmark and it cites the Monsanto versus Scruggs case. <laughs> and it reiterates um, that, again, a, pur a purchase has to be authorized. And let me give the backstory on that. And the reason I know, so I, as James mentioned, I was on the trial team on that. We litigated that case for 11 years, tried it. Uh, to a jury for a month in Greenville, Mississippi. And the, the, the actual history of that quote was we found this guy had 10,000 acres of BT cotton. We said, hey, where'd you get all that BT cotton? Oh, yeah, I bought it from your dealer three years ago. And he did the math. We said, how many bags did you buy? So he did the reverse math of how many, how much, how many uh, cotton seed you could catch at the gin over a three-year period from the original, I think it came up with 10 bags. But he made the math work. So anyway, he made that argument. He said, well, no, your patent rights are exhausted because I bought it from your dealer three years ago and they never had me sign an agreement or anything. So um, the actual Northern District of Mississippi judge uh, rejected that argument. And it's nice to see that that precedent is still around and just got cited uh, in 2017. I'll leave you with the more interesting part of that case, which in addition to 10,000 acres of BT cotton, he had 10,000 acres of herbicide-resistant soybeans. But we said, okay, Mr. Scruggs, Thank you for your story about your BT cotton. Where did you get the herbicide resistant soybean? So we're expecting another story. You went to a dealer. Oh, no, no. I invented these. I said, what? <laughs> Absolutely. I go, how did you invent herbicide resistant soybean? I took my sprayer. I, I added, I turned down the concentration rate and it took me two years, but I did a little, just sprayed a little bit, <laughs> just sprayed a little bit more. So after a couple of years, he, he, and he, he testified to this under oath. He refused. He, he wouldn't call him the, the brand name or trademark, which I won't use. Um, I guess the client name's out there. But um, uh, anyway, so he, test, he testified under oath that he had created his own herbicide-resistant soybean. Well, anyway, after a month-long trial, a jury of his peers in Greenville, Mississippi, uh, with local lawyers against a bunch of Yankees out of St. Louis, the jury awarded $9 million to the plaintiff and uh, didn't exactly believe the herbicide resistant soybean story. So with that, I have many more stories. If you see me around later, I'll talk a year off, but i um, happy to uh, uh, answer questions with the rest of the group, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that was a great session. Thank you guys for everything you've done for your presentation. Um, yeah, let's open it up for questions. Uh, what questions from the group here? Yes, sir. So my first question is, how do you guys advise your clients when deciding what form of IP to protect? So uh, a classic example is CBP versus patent. What are some of your considerations when you are picking between the two or you know, choosing both? Well, I ask them first um, what they what they who they're going to sell to and what they expect to get and how much money they have. It's cheaper to do PVP than you know one of the other possibilities. But also, if they've got like methods and other things we can put in, method of controlling weeds, you know, method of making plants, method of doing. Then I say, well, let's do the U.S. utility. Now, if they got some money, I say do both, you know, because then then we're kind of covered all the way around. So that's that's how I ask. It's sort of a more a business. 
decision then, assuming they can do it and they can get away with it. And I think I think somebody mentioned that you can't get plants uh, copied in, or protected in the U.S. That's really not true. You just have to be a little careful how you describe the plant so that it's not a natural product and it's different from other things and it has to be used. So I can get patents on plants. It's just, you know, in the U.S. utility, you just have to be a little careful how you explain them. Debbie, what are your thoughts on that, on this question? I agree with Alice, and I meant to, I think I'm the one who said it, I meant to say that you can protect plants in the U.S. and not in the rest of the world very easily. And the rest of the world is with, our, with patents, but I, I agree, I think it's really a business decision. Um, how big a part is of your business? What do you plan to do with that IP? Do you want to try to enforce? Are you worried about people doing research? And you can do breeding and research under the PDP. You cannot do that under patent. So that might be a consideration. PDP stops people from selling these, you know, for plants for, for propagated purposes. And that's all basically. So if you have other concerns, the patent might be a better option for you. What other questions we got? I have one more for JJ if possible. Please. So, can you take a step in the generic versus trademark thing? Can you make it a, take it a step further and make your generic name so, like, unappealing as possible? Like, could I make it artificially modified apple number six? So, and then call it sugary sweet apple as my trademark name? And then that way you would have to use the artificially modified apple as the generic. Um, what, what is your objective? The short answer is, Yes, you can have an ugly, uh, difficult to pronounce generic <laughs> name, like an XYZ123 or Supercalifragilistic, whatever you want. Um, what is your objective? And I don't know about using multiple words that might be uh, difficult from an internal perspective and using that variety name. But what types of, well, I mean, just to extend the useful life, you know, going back to your tree example, extend the useful life of your patent or your trademark. You know, like how do you, especially with trees, when you only have 20 years on a tree, it's kind of hard. Oh, so to make it difficult for a third party to name the, the product out in the marketplace? Right. I mean, you're going to have to use that generic name yourself to identify the product. You're going to want to use that regularly. Oh. You won't lose your trademark rights, so you're, uh, you might be shooting yourself in the foot if you make it too difficult for Okay. We also, if I could step in on this, the Van Wall smoothie case is also something you're going to be watching out for because if you have a trademark name and you have the variety name, but you're not good about keeping track of uh, or making sure your licensees know the difference and they start using the trademark name consistently and it becomes known as the product, right. you also, the trademark can become generic, like Escalator, mm -hmm. like that's so many things, Playnex, whatever. And that's why you want to be vigilant in your licensing program to watch your licensee and how they're using uh, the trademark and, and the generic name and make sure to don't get your bank. Right. Licensing, policing your licensees on their use is very important. Yeah. And that goes back to a question we got um, over the internet. Um, JJ, once a patent uh, expires and a variety continues to be used and sold under a TM, is there a danger of that TM becoming generic? Uh, so long as you continue to visualize use that generic name uh, and, and don't associate, uh, don't identify the trademark as the generic name of the product, you should be fine. That trademark will last forever and you will always have protection for your license and that, that brand itself. So, and, and that's a good point. Trademarks can last forever yeah. as opposed to patent and PPP rights which do expire. Yeah. And then how common is it for seed companies to trademark names of varieties? Um, you know, it's a, that's a business decision, I think, in the research and development. Uh, there is usually a general sense of how valuable a variety right, exactly. is going to be, and some just don't make the cut, and they never make it to market, and you wouldn't go through an extensive branding uh, process for those. Uh, so I think that's good. But if there's value there, you want to get a trademark associated with that. Uh, it's going to help you exploit that value. And that's another place where you need a system with triggers and timing to catch these things at the right point and make the decision so that you can be proactive and acting on it. 
What other questions we got from the audience? Yes, sir. I have one for Matt. Um, the resolution to that would have been that the stuff of the licensee at that point being the people buying the printer cartridge. Right. They would have then had a contractual agreement with them just as if they were moving it through the process of the seed. That would have resolved this all the way through, correct? Because if it was a license agreement, they would have had a flow back in our world accounting for royalty up the chain. But instead, they weren't able to stop because of the sale. Yeah, they tried to have their cake and eat it too. So they said, I'm going to sell you this, but I'm going to have a license also. And they said, you can't do both. Right. So if they would have pulled the sale, they just said, enter into the license, at least I think they got a decent argument. Okay. But it's the sale that's the problem. Once the sale comes in, your patent rights are done. With regard to that item, I mean, people right. can't reinvent. I have to be glad to be good. Don't worry. You know, going to market doesn't risk patent completely, obviously. What other questions we got? Julie, are there any more questions online? Excellent. Well, we have hit our 3.30 time. I uh, want to thank our speakers again. You guys did an excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. If you're interested in CEPA, please, there's information on the back. Uh, feel free to contact me at any point in time as well. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you.